Well, um, Dr. Lisa Peters, I'm so glad you're here. Can you introduce yourself, tell us about yourself and what you're doing here at IVEX this year? My name is Dr. Lisa Peters and I am a criticalist. I work in private practice and I am here speaking on stress in the emergency pr profession and particularly suicide, how it impacts our profession and how we can maintain resilience in the ER team. It's a brave topic to talk about. People don't like to talk about it um, and they're afraid and I loved that we opened the dialogue by saying, hey, there's this myth that if we talk about it, we're going to cause it, we're going to make it worse. I think that's true and I think that's been, certainly in the United States, I think that has been a really big fear and like we stated in the talk, the UK has just moved forward with this topic way before we did. I think they recognized there was a problem in veterinary medicine years ago, and we just kind of uh, kept back with that a little bit and said, hmm, not happening here, and now we're starting to catch on that veterinarians here are just as impacted as they are all over the world. And now we're taking notice, and now we're talking more about it, and I think it's so important. We've opened the door and we've started the conversation. What's the next step towards doing something more like the UK? I think we need to keep talking about it. I think we need to keep doing this at veterinary conferences. I think we need to keep addressing this in veterinary schools. So we have to bring this to the forefront at the student level because that's going to keep it on their minds as they transition into practice because we know that that's a really vulnerable time as they move into practice as young veterinarians. It's a very stressful time. And then I think we need to make sure that there is a lot of support systems all over the place that they know that they can go to if they're feeling like they're in trouble. I was found the risk factors to be very interesting and I was floored by the statistical relevance of debt. Mm -hmm. um, to suicide risk. Yeah. That was fascinating. To yeah. Me. So as debt increases, our suicide risk goes up and it starts as early as veterinary school. Mm -hmm. You know, so students are stressed about the amount of debt that they have. And if they're coming with debt from undergraduate into veterinary school and then they're leaving veterinary school with, you know, 50,000, close to $100,000 worth of debt, their, their stress level really goes up. It's got to feel so helpless, and mm -hmm. that's, that's that situation. So what are there resources that are out there to help people manage that financial stress as well as, as the emotional stress of being a vet student? I think there are a lot of resources that they can tap into. I think it's just finding the right ones that, that work for them for at least managing the financial piece of it. Um, and I think that's just a very individual thing about how can they manage that financial piece of it. And you know, moving from veterinary school into practice, they're also looking at how am I going to even be able to afford a home? That's a very stressful part. And um, then some of them are thinking about, can I even be a practice owner? That's not even on the forefront of their mind when they have so much student debt. Um, so some of them feel like they're so far behind when they get out, they're, they're just really, really struggling. Do you think that, that we're going to be seeing as these, more stud these studies are becoming more prevalent, um, that this impacts the entirety of the veterinary team? Um, I know that our technicians are coming out of school with significant debt compared to what we used to, um, and the wage ranges aren't changing significantly, and of course, cost of living. I do. I don't think anybody is immune to the stress levels in our veterinary practices. I think, you know, I think technicians are horribly underpaid. <laughs> I mean, that's just my personal opinion. I think they're under the same stress level that we're under, and even the reception team. I mean, we can't forget about them and the veterinary assistants. I mean, you know, some of us, you know, even the people who are on the front lines, like the veterinary receptionists, they're sometimes the first ones to see the grieving owners and the distraught owners when they come in those doors, you know, so they're also dealing with stress. They also have to deal with the, the clients who are upset about finances. So they may be impacted a little bit differently, but they're still impacted. So. 
even though we're talking about veterinarians, I think we have to talk about the veterinary team. So that could be future, potentially future topics that we can address here at these conferences. I um, also attended the resilience in the veterinary team talk and I found that that was very applicable to um, to everyone um, again uh, some of the takeaways from that were expressing gratitude um, every day every find, day. finding something just anything stopping your brain and just being grateful for something right just saying thank you thank you uh, to someone who is working really hard for you and I forget to do that sometimes and sometimes I you know go back up and I'm starting my records and I realized you know that technician just worked on that case with me for two hours and I just walked away from them while they recovered a patient and I'll call them back down on their page or phone and say hey you did a good job or hey thank you and that just means you know it means so much to them and sometimes I'll also leave work and I forgot to say they did a good job and if I have their phone number I'll text them and say hey you did a really good job today so do I do that all the time no I think we need to get better at that showing gratitude because that really really helps yeah. Resilience in our um, ER teams. Um, so we have shift work, um, we have pressure. How do we tell someone that we're seeing, hey, it looks like you're struggling, why don't you take a five minute break? And they're like, I'm not gonna do that. How do we really encourage that? What do we do? I think that's hard to do because um, certainly when they say that to you, they don't, they might get embarrassed or they might say, you know, I'm doing fine because they don't want to show their coworkers that they're not doing fine. I have sometimes gone into another room and if they're in a room where there's a phone, I'll call down and say, hey, is so-and-so there? And talk to them and say, hey, I need you. Can you come up and talk to me? So I've actually pulled them out of a situation where they're in front of other people and said, come up and sit by me for a few minutes and have them just come sit by me and I'll you know, address it one-on-one. -on -one. So addressing it in front of others is, is not usually a good thing to do from what I've found and trying to just pull them out of that situation as a one-on-one -on -one and giving them time to just sit in silence. And what about um, finding, we often, I have found myself in the situation where I've said, I, can't, I feel like I can't leave this patient. How do I get to a place where I personally can walk away? Yeah, I mean, that's us admitting, hey, I'm out, I need, I need a break. And that's finding it within ourselves to say, I'm probably not doing a good job right now if I really am to the point where I need a break. And so I oftentimes think about, I don't think this patient is gonna do very well if I'm not doing very well. So you need somebody to relieve you. And so that's just finding it within yourself to, to, to muster up and say, I, I need some help because this I'm not serving this patient well and I need to go take five. How do we teach self-awareness to our team? That's tough. <laughs> that's, a, that's tough. I think I think it has to be through education, right? I think education is the best thing that we can do. And so if if we don't personally don't have the tools to teach self-awareness, then we find somebody who does. You know, so do research within your community and say who can come in and teach us some self-awareness tactics. You know, and there are so many people who are willing to come in and, and coach your team, you know, on some of these on some of these tools. And I think just looking around your community to find out who can come in, I think is so valuable. I was really surprised by the warning signs. Um, about um, lack of resilience that were mentioned. So um, being confused, um, I, 
realize that I often say, I'm sorry, I didn't understand that and um, wonder if that isn't mental fatigue. I agree with you, or being forgetful all the time. Like I feel like I'm developing, me personally, the same thing. Sometimes I feel like, am I, do I have a disorder? Like do I need to go to a neurologist because I have just forgotten the case I saw that morning. Someone will bring up a name of a patient and you think, did I see that case today? And then I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I, I might have a disorder right now. And so then that is telling me to myself that I may not be doing very well right now. I am a little on overload and I need to take a step back. And, and so I think part of that, when you start seeing some of those warning signs, now that we know what they are, is doing those self checks yeah. and saying, I heard something about that. I need to do a self check and take a step back. I loved that some of the tools were easy, so they were breathing, mm -hmm. um, drinking our water. Mm -hmm. um, we know about eating well. Um, I am a little distressed that Cheetos aren't a real food. Yes. <laughs> and, and Mountain, are you and Mountain sure? Dew, Mountain Dew, we're Dew sure isn't? Mountain Dew doesn't fit in this. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I'm really disappointed. <laughs> and I also heard maybe that coffee didn't actually fit in. I either. didn't. Well, you notice I came in with a Starbucks, <laughs> and so we haven't taken that away yet. So there's room. There's room in there. There's for, room. For some Cheetos and some. We just Mountain can't Dew. rely on it heavily. We shouldn't self-medicate with those things. That's the important thing. Excellent. So we should be using water um, and our. Um, uh, good food um, and getting out um, and I noticed that the 20 minutes a day of being out in nature you guys said can be broken up into even like five minutes yeah five minute spurts I mean sometimes on a really hectic day if I am just you know really crazy I'll just walk out the back door and just take a deep breath and look at the Sun and sometimes it's just a few seconds and come back in and that's regenerating you know, so I, I think even doing that can be so helpful for the mind. Um, so talking about resilience and about tools that we can use um, and using gratitude, um, we're eating right, we're staying hydrated, we're doing all of these things, um, and we're still struggling. What is, um, what's the next step? Do we, do we have resources that we should be reaching out to? Is it better to reach out to a coworker, a family member? Where do we go? I think reaching out to someone, whoever you feel most comfortable with is what's most important, that you're just getting in touch with someone and letting them know that you're struggling and things aren't going well and you need help and, and, and that you're having a hard time finding where to go and that someone will help you find a place to go. Some businesses have EPA or other services that they can help direct them to and Personally, we brought up a good point in the lecture today that sometimes you don't even know, even if you get that piece of paper that says, here's the phone number to go to EPA, recognizing that sometimes they can't even pick up the phone hmm. to call and say, saying to that person, you know what, I'll go with you. I'll drop you off. I'll drive you. I'll take you or I'll make that phone call for you. That can help a person who's really, really having a tough time. I loved that um, combination of let's empower the person, um, but be there with them. Mm -hmm. So they're still taking that step, but they're not doing it alone. Correct. And definitely in those feel times, we definitely feel very isolated. I agree with you. I found the breakdown of the differences in um, chronic stress and compassion fatigue um, and suicidal ideation to be very interesting. Um, I kind of thought of them um, as all one continuum, mm -hmm. and it looks like they're very different um, when you the way you guys broke it down. Am I misreading that? No, you're not misreading it at all. I, it is not a continuum. I think they're all, Janine really highlighted the differences between burnout, compassion fatigue, and depression. So no, it's not a continuum, and sometimes you can be stuck just in one of those. And so it's not like you go from burnout to compassion fatigue to depression. So 
Um, I think it was a very clear distinction between all three of those, and I think that, that is, uh, that's important. It's important to understand and try to find out where am I fitting in that, and uh, d really just mostly recognizing that I'm not well. Yeah. You know, right now things aren't going that well, and what can I do to help try to change that? Thank you so much for coming in and talking to us. It felt like I walked out of your lectures knowing that there's hope and knowing that there's a group oh. of people who really care and that we are going to come to a place where we can have these conversations openly and honestly, and we can slow this horrible progression. Oh, um, thank you. We really want to make a difference, so. I think that you guys thank did. you. Just even in the lecture, just opening it up, I know that there were people um, in that lecture who were touched personally, mm -hmm. um, who just being in that room, knowing that someone cared about them enough to talk at a conference made a difference. Oh, thank you so much. You're so welcome. Thank Thanks. you again.